Welcome everyone to today's roundtable discussion. I'm Mackenzie Bean with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's roundtable with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. And we're looking forward to hearing all your questions. This session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's roundtable to access the recording. At this time, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Ben to begin today's presentation. Howdy, everyone. Thanks, Mackenzie. I'm Ben Zaniello. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Collective Medical, and I appreciate everyone coming on. Uh, you should see on your screen, hopefully you're not just uh, hearing me thrown on, but you're also able to see some of the slides we're going to show. Um, Right now, everyone should be seeing a slide that says, creating certainty amidst uncertainty in value-based care. Uh, uncertainty, of course, being the watchword today uh, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and also the political shifts and economic shifts in healthcare in our wider society. We have a great group uh, to cover, these, uh, cover this today. Um, we are not going to go through a bunch of side, side where I want to warn everyone. We actually got tons and tons of questions. So we're actually going to focus on the questions that people submitted. And we have some great um, experts in this area that are going to cover these agenda items. Um, generally speaking, we can see these learning objectives and our goal for uh, today, um, talking about care and costs associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, talking about organizational behavior and adaptation in the setting of this pandemic, particularly around value-based care. Um, Objective three uh, will cover the, um, the safety net population, those that traditionally lack access to health care, and how potentially to better manage them during the COVID-19 pandemic in the setting of value-based care. And then finally, thinking about technology and the social determinants of health. We've gotten questions on all four of these subjects, so we're actually going to really use those question stems to uh, bring forward the discussion. All that said, Please, please, please uh, submit uh, questions as we go through this. We may try to intersperse some of the live questions in with, uh, um, with the active discussion, or we'll get to them at the end, but we will try to get to everything. And if we can't, or we feel your question uh, is better answered individually, uh, someone from a uh, collective will uh, follow up with you. So again, I appreciate everyone being on. Um, we'll now kind of go through the introductions and hear a little about the, the people you're um, going to hear from. As I mentioned, I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Collective Medical. Uh, before this, I was with uh, Providence St. Joseph's Health, uh, West Coast-based health system. It's their CMIO of pers uh, population health. I'm also a uh, practicing infectious disease doctor, which makes these period, uh, this particular period very exciting for me, uh, as you can imagine. And of course, uh, I also focus on what's considered the high risk safety net population in my work. So I've worked actively with everyone that's uh, about to present, and I know that uh, we're in for a treat here because they're going to provide us some really interesting insights on how to manage this. Uh, our first uh, discussant is Deborah Jean. Deborah Jean, tell us about yourself. Okay. My name is Deborah Jean Parsons. I am a principal at DJP Consulting. I have worked in the field of uh, healthcare, education, children's mental health, adult services for over 25 years in uh, multiple different ways. Most recently, I was Director of Integrated Care for Aspire Health Alliance, where for three years, I led two of the community partner programs in Massachusetts Medicaid Incentive Payment and Care Delivery Program, which is a five-year demonstration project with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to completely redesign how we deliver care for the Medicaid population with the goal of reducing uh, the costs in the system while we improve healthcare outcomes. And within that new design, the community partners are specifically responsible for 
the most challenging, most expensive, most vulnerable of the Medicaid population, those with complex medical, behavioral health, and social needs. And these community-based teams are responsible to provide integrated care between primary care, behavioral health, and social services to improve their health outcomes and reduce costs in the system. Great, thank you. Uh, Carol Ann. Thanks. Um, I'm Carol Ann Hudson. I'm a registered nurse here in Tennessee, actually a native of Nashville, um, very rare around here these days. Um, I have worked for LifePoint Health for the past four and a half years and am on the population health team. I, um, our population health team actually has started three ACOs um, last, they've been going for a year now, and um, they are in, one is in Virginia, one is up in the UP of Michigan, and the other one is in Pennsylvania. Uh, I am the one clinical um, person on the population health team, and so I do a lot of working with the networks and the facilities and the providers to um, help them manage the clinical outcomes of their patients and um, work a lot with care coordination and patient engagement, which I think you're going to hear about today. I am the quality officer for all three of the ACOs and I'm going to specifically focus today on our ACO in Virginia, where I think we're doing some unique things uh, with care coordination and care management that um, I would love to share with you guys. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Carol Ann. And last but not least, Melissa. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is Melissa Haney. Uh, I work for Northwest Physicians Network under Optum Care. I am the Community Partnerships and Behavioral Health Integration Regional Manager there. Um, a lot of my background, I think, that's relevant to our discussion today has to do with doing a lot of community collaboration work, um, particularly in focus for patients who are high utilizers. Um, and who have kind of comorbidities between chronic health issues and behavioral health. Uh, we had a five-year-long project uh, that we worked with numerous different community organizations like hospitals, primary care, behavioral health, uh, crisis workers, social services, and we coordinated care um, in a way that was um, turned out to be very effective. Um, we ended up reducing 911 calls by 44 um, percent, uh, avoidable emergency department visits by 36, and hospital admissions by 42 percent. Uh, currently, I am doing a lot of work um, in a different county in Washington State, kind of assisting them and uh, trying to set up a similar program, um, and also doing a lot of work around behavioral health integration so that we can offer whole person care services to our patients um, who have complex needs. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks, everyone. Okay, so we're going to plunge into some of these questions. Now, the kind of biggest opener question we had, and I really had people kind of cover it in their introductions, which was the biggest way that COVID-19 has impacted your strategy for reducing healthcare costs, reducing unnecessary utilization, and improving quality of care. That's a big question. And so what we've done is we've actually broken that question down to its requisite parts, and each person is going to focus on a little aspect of their organization that's focused around it. So, for example, we're going to go first into primary care providers and how we can better support them. And why we decided this was a priority is that when we asked ACO leadership what their priority was post-COVID, the majority said supporting primary care providers going forward uh, is of active importance. And Specifically to talk about that, uh, Carol Ann, I would love for you to come in and talk about how you are supporting primary care providers uh, in the setting of COVID-19. Thanks. So again, I'm specifically speaking about our Vantage Point Health Alliance Blue Ridge, which is in Virginia, southern and southwestern Virginia. 
Um, in that particular ACO and clinically integrated network, we actually have a team of care coordinators, of nurses and community health workers who are helping out the primary care providers by helping the patients close gaps in care. So they're not only just managing and doing chronic care management and transitional care management with our patients, but they're also, as I said, helping close those care gaps for quality measures and take that burden off of the primary care practices. The commercial payers right now are starting to supply more home testing kits for colorectal cancer, microalbumin in the urine, hemoglobin A1C, and other things. And that's helping us out because patients aren't coming into the practices um, because of COVID and are not being seen. Another thing that they're doing is um, promoting annual wellness visits being done via telehealth and um, being able to uh, to help the providers get those scheduled and reduce the burden on the clinic staff. Carol Ann, let me ask you a follow-up question. How do you feel, how do you generally feel that they feel? Like as you interact with primary care providers, is there, I, I recognize, I think all of us probably could say universally was, were terribly panicked in the early days of COVID and maybe have become increasingly more panicked as, uh, as the pandemic has continued. Do you think there is, however, some settling into a new normal for them and how they manage their patients and how they interact with you? Uh, is there still a feeling of whether inconsistency or concern uh, going forward? I think that they are starting to settle into the new normal, and I think the new normal is going to be some kind of combination of in-person visits and telehealth visits um, going forward. The, I think the biggest benefit and the reason that our, our primary care has um, really endorsed and likes having these care coordinators take, you know, touching base with their patients is because um, a lot of those had to actually close their offices. And yes, the providers were trying to get started doing telehealth and everything, but the offices were actually closed and their staff wasn't there, you know, depending on which, um, you know, depending on what the state laws and the local laws and things like that. And so these were still nurses that were reaching out proactively to their patients and could identify um, patients that were getting into trouble, you know, the congestive heart failure patient that's weight starting to creep up, and could then reach out to the primary care and say, hey, you know, we talked to Ms. Smith this morning, and this is what we did, found out, um, and maybe you could see her as a telehealth visit, and we could get her some medication adjustments. That's that's incredibly helpful. I think uh, certainly in my practice and what we're seeing at Collective is while there were massive changes early on, I think uh, one of the things we saw in our data that was mirrored across the country, for example, is the dramatic reduction in emergency department utilization as just one example. And while that has shifted so that the emergency department and I think non telehealth visits are starting to increase in the primary care space. I think we are all accepting that that the the new normal will be actually more consistent and that we won't see the kind of dramatic changes that we saw before, but nor will we see a return to uh, how medicine was practiced. I would qualify that as a uh, for better or for worse. So thank you. Um, going into the next question, which was specifically around behavioral health and substance use disorders, um, looking at kind of the names on this call and certainly the co-presenters, I think a lot of us have deep insight uh, into what's happening with behavioral health in the setting of COVID. But based on uh, some of the audience and some of the questions we received, we thought it'd be helpful to flag these for maybe people less aware of the uh, dramatic changes in behavioral health and behavioral health management in the setting of COVID-19. Um, some statistics are on the screen, and again, uh, as uh, tempting as it always is to read slides to people, I, I just promised you that I wouldn't. But we are seeing a rise in uh, opioid-related, substance use-related, and behavioral health uh, diagnoses and um, the greater difficulty in managing these in the setting of COVID. Um, just from an access perspective, we I just mentioned the uh, decrease in utilization of emergency departments. Again, for better or for worse, emergency departments have been on the forefront of opioid care 
uh, and more recently focusing on uh, ED bridge programs and facilitating um, so that uh, patients that are coming to the emergency department to address their needs are uh, able to get a link to a uh, opioid treatment provider. There are fewer of those opioid treatment providers that are available and they are less available, which means that you are seeing um, um, a risk around uh, uh, the greater uh, level of mismanagement around these diagnoses. Uh, I love this statistic that uh, we found that a 65% increase in clients per therapist since February. I think given the trauma, the collective trauma that we've all experienced of COVID, I don't think this is probably a surprise to anyone. But again, I'd love to hear um, uh, some of our presenters talk about this a little bit. Uh, Melissa, can you uh, uh, give us your insight? Yeah, I would be happy to. Um, so, you know, I think that we've um, seen a few different things. Um, of course, originally, um, we just saw a lot of uh, anxiety. Um, we have a large Medicare Advantage population. Um, so, you know, just seeing a lot of older adults experiencing a lot of isolation um, and uh, being very unsure about when and how to access services. Um, so, you know, in the past where they might have reached out to be able either to their primary care or to a behavioral health provider, um, just being, you know, really reticent about when they should do that because of concerns about their health. Um, luckily, you know, we were able to come on pretty quick with different uh, virtual care services for our network. Um, and so a lot of patients, I think, have been helped, you know, because of that, at least through primary care um, and also in behavioral health. Um, but we have a, a large population of patients that really just don't respond very well, um, you know, to uh, accessing health care virtually. Um, or, you know, they're just unable to um, because of a variety of reasons, either like their location, um, because they're in a rural area and the broadband isn't good enough, or um, financially they don't have enough access to data for their plan. Um, so that has made it really difficult for them. So, you know, as a uh, result, we've also seen real increase in substance use disorder um, on the medical side. Um, and uh, increases in comorbidity with depression and anxiety when patients are inpatient as well. Um, and there's just, there's a lot of confusion about how patients um, can access inpatient behavioral health when they need it as well because the rules um, for admits has changed um, because they need to have medical clearance. On that dichotomy I mentioned earlier, really about kind of being able to actively manage behavioral health um, in the setting of COVID-19, so being able to be proactive with your population versus given this kind of deluge of either new diagnosis or worsening diagnosis and having being reactive, are you finding organizationally you're able to, to strike a balance there? Do you still feel you're managing them fairly react, reactive? Uh, lately given the um given just this kind of sheer volume and concern i think we are i mean we're definitely coming up um with some really great plans to be able to offer behavioral health services um because we we've had to map out new ways um, in order to reach the population and then make sure that they actually have access um where they're at um, but it's it's definitely been tricky, um, and you know there's a population of people again that really need to be seen in person. They just don't really engage, um, or we can't engage them um, if we can't go and see them when they're in the emergency department or you know inpatient or wherever they might be. Um, so I think that is the population um, that we really have to kind of rely on our community partners. Um, to try to work with them together to reach out to these patients. And do you find there is a reticence on either parties, either the patient themselves or the provider, from doing an in-person visit 
are, are you are you having to kind of more aggressively facilitate that interaction or do you find that once you kind of break the seal and, and set it up, people are showing up for appointments, there are appointments available, that sort of thing? So I, I'm going to say, you know, in our community, um, organizations want to, of course, be able to protect their staff, um, but all of the people who I know who um, have traditionally seen people in person and reached out to them, especially, especially if they're doing kind of like higher level, um, not crisis, but, you know, response to a high level of need, um, they're all they all just want to get out there and they all really want to make contact with these patients. They feel really bad because they know that they're isolated and they really need help. Um, and so they just gear up and they get out there and they make contact with them and they try to see what they can do to help them. Well, that's obviously wonder wonderful here. And I think probably uh, good insight for all of us about just as we're re recognizing that there's massive uh, uh, late need, late in demand for these services that there is a set of people that, that are kind of re ready and willing to help out. Obviously, as you pointed out, it's very much uh, uh, community driven, particularly uh, regarding availability. Um, there was a lack of behavioral health and SUD providers pre-COVID. Uh, COVID has probably not helped us out in that regard. So depending what state you're in uh, and what region, it's from, there, there's, there is probably some variability there, but I think it, I, I appreciate that you flagged that there is a deep desire for people to help. Uh, again, most people that went into Bay Barrel Health did it out of a uh, 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 strong concentration and, and, and interest in that population. Um, that's actually a great segue to Deborah Jean, who I know works specifically in that space. And I'd love uh, your thoughts on what's happening uh, in Massachusetts, but also what you've seen. And I noticed uh, Melissa actually helpfully both answered the question on the screen and also this next one, the kind of what steps are you taking to address these issues? And Regine, I'd love for you to uh, talk about both of those as well. Yeah, thank you very much. And <clears throat> Melissa is absolutely right. Um, everything that she said, I can concur, is what's happening in Massachusetts. And as she said, they, to, she, they are relying on their community partners to do this work. So in Massachusetts, the community partner program is designed specifically to go out, be in the community, working with the highest, cha most challenging, highest risk patients, uh, and the ones with the most complexity. Um, and as soon as our teams, you know, were able, because we had moved into phase one and then phase two, we were able to get out into the community, we were there. Because um, Melissa is absolutely right. There are many people for whom access to telehealth um, just does not fit. Um, and it could be because they just don't have the technology. You know, they don't have the bandwidth on their phone. And other ones, just as Melissa said, they really need to be seen in person. So we have fortunately been able to now, as we are opening up, go with our patients once again to their primary care visits to help advocate um, for them during those visits and go um, and get them in-person behavioral health services and get them back into methadone and SUD programs um, which they desperately need. And, you know, our patient population already struggle with significant mental health conditions, right? So this pandemic only worsened those. And uh, we were fortunate as a, a program that early on the state invested heavily in tools, technology, and people to make sure that our teams are completely mobile and all of our tools are cloud-based and integrated so our teams can work anywhere, anytime in the field, which means when they meet with somebody, they, can, they have access to the whole internet and all of the providers. So we were fortunate, very fortunate to have done that work two years before this pandemic because if we didn't have that in place, we really would have had our hands strapped. So with the tools, technology, and manpower, we have been able to actually increase our activity with our patient population, and that's been across the state. 
Awesome. Well, that's fantastic. And obviously your foresight in setting up the, the technological infrastructure seems to have made a huge difference. I think one of the current struggles is, again, I, I think people have recognized it's the, we had, say, if you had an existing technological infrastructure gap, uh, particularly in the field, this has made it that much more dire. I think we've all seen at even a national level, the, the, the chronic lack of kind of interoperability and data sharing among organizations, even the hospital data flowing up to uh, county, state, and federal governments has uh, led um, to, you know, insights maybe not being reached as fast as we would like and or uh, care coordination issues that obviously um, when you're dealing with these high-risk populations can be particularly dire. So kind of flowing forward, we've talked about um, behavioral health patients and really talking about how to manage them. I think there is an added piece to this, in which is really identifying proactively who the high-risk patients are. I alluded to some of those insights uh, uh, that we've uh, developed at, whether it's a federal or a state level, I think it's interesting, obviously, in the set of COVID, the lack of information and um, some of the earliest information that came out uh, anywhere from quarantining in mass, but also the most high-risk uh, persons, either from a personal security perspective or um, a transmission of the illness, that obviously continues to change um, um, if, if not monthly and weekly, sometimes daily. Um, that said, uh, early on, for example, I remember receiving the first CDC directive, which this is flagged here, which underlying chronic conditions, me meaning the highest risk of death in the setting of COVID, um, particularly, for example, end-stage renal disease. I remember that being kind of an early flag. So that leads us kind of uh, one of our audience questions, which was, uh, what are we doing differently with those at-risk patients uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic? And uh, Carol Ann, I'd love to have you comment. Sure, thanks. So in our Blue Ridge ACO, which is also, as I said before, a clinically integrated network, we not only have our Medicare shared savings population to manage, but we also have multiple um, Medicare Advantage and Medicaid contracts with the commercial payers in our CIN. So we were able to take advantage of the fact that in Virginia back in July of 2018, the collective medical platform was implemented across the whole state um, it was a statutory requirement that everybody was on board by July 1st of 2018, and that actually is helping us get real-time notifications. What we did since COVID started, and to be honest, we had already planned to do it. It just happened that it, it went live during then, but it's, it's really, really helped us in this category, and that is we implemented the collective medical platform for our care coordinators and our, um, that I was talking about previously. So now our care coordinators, they know the panel of patients that they're responsible for. They now have real-time notifications of ED visits um, and inpatient admissions and discharges. What they do with those notifications is then they assign those, if it's a new patient that's in the ACO population, for instance, that's not previously been assigned a care, a care coordinator, now they'll be assigned a care coordinator who will follow them for up to 90 days post-discharge. We're trying to work with them to reduce readmissions, make sure that they're um, getting to their follow-up appointments, um, basically doing that transition to care management with those patients. Um, and we also have community health workers that we can send out into the field that can go to their homes or contact them by phone and um, help to make sure that patients have what they need. What we're doing to pick which patients are followed for how long is we stratify the patients based on their ED usage, their readmissions, their LACE scores, if it's greater than 10, or if they have greater than or equal to two chronic conditions can help us determine which, if they fall into our 30-day bucket, our 60-day bucket, or our 90-day bucket. Our goal is, with our care coordinators, is that you know once they get that notification of discharge from the hospital, they're to contact the patient within two business days to make sure that they were able to get their medications, they know when their follow-up appointment is, um, they actually facilitate making some of those appointments because if a patient's discharged over a weekend, the 
um, nurses might not have been able to get that follow-up appointment made. We also try to steer them back to primary care, even if they were in the hospital for a orthopedic surgery. Um, we they are going to have their orthopedic follow-up about their surgery, but we try to get them back into primary care so that the primary care doctors can be the, the traffic cop and uh, keep up with the patients. So those are some things that we've started doing, and I said it's coincidentally that it happened since the COVID pandemic, but it has been very effective. We had some really early wins in it. Uh, we had one patient that um, didn't, they had their follow-up appointment scheduled with their primary care, but when the community health worker called to remind them of it and to make sure that they didn't have any barriers to getting to the appointment, what they found out was the patient lives on the same street in Danville, Virginia, as the doctor's office is. However, it was several miles away, and the patient didn't have transportation, and she was planning on walking to and from the doctor's office. And this was in the 90 plus degree weather. She's recently been hospitalized for her chronic condition and definitely didn't need to be out. And so the community health worker was able to connect her with transportation that's local, free for seniors, and um, actually introduced her to that service. So not only was the patient able to get back and forth to the doctor that day, but they also were able to utilize that in the future for other things like going grocery shopping, going to the pharmacy, and things that the patient had been walking all over town in the high heat. So we've definitely been able to take advantage of the collective platform and really think that it's improving the care of our patients that are assigned to us. Well, Carol Ann, I love you actually created a great segue into kind of one of the, the common discussion points, and certainly where we uh, have a lot of questions. You've talked a lot about transportation in that last piece, and I think that's really, really important. Again, looking at our audience members, this is based on kind of roles. This is not a group that needs to be reminded of the criticality of this uh, social determinants of health, uh, transportation, uh, food insecurity, shelter insecurity as, uh, as a part of this. Um, and, and like, again, everything else, not to sound like a broken record, has been um, exacerbated uh, in the setting of COVID-19 from an access perspective, a visibility perspective. Um, I'd love to have all our uh, discussions kind of opine on the social determinants of health. Maybe, uh, uh, Deborah Jean, I'll start with you. Uh, what, are, what are some of your thoughts and insights on the subject? Thank you. Uh, so you are absolutely correct. Uh, we don't need to remind people that the social determinants of health actually matter greatly and have been exacerbated. Um, what we have found similar to what um, uh, Carol Ann said is that the use of our event notification system through Collective Medical, which is integrated into our medical record platform, has been tremendously helpful, especially during a time when um, we've all been uh, at home um, and we've been able to know where our patients are and follow them over time and intervene when we can. And similar to the teams Carol Ann um, uh, discussed about, we actually follow our uh, folks for six months to a year. In fact, we've had some people for 18 months and more. And really finding them, engaging them, and working with them over time to help them while they're waiting for their housing to come through, while we're waiting to get their Social Security disability and all the other community resources in place for them, has been really, really critical. And yes, it was a challenge during the pandemic, but, um, but our teams just, they're just like, we need to do this. Um, and as soon as the public um, benefits became online, again, we're, we're mobile, we were able to, to access them right away. And so as the advances in the overall uh, space of having more utility of online platforms, telehealth, uh, the use of text messages, all of that, ha that has helped us with a population that obviously needs a lot of support over time. Awesome. Thank you. I, 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 if, if it seems there's a recur recurring theme, I'm hearing the word kind of visibility uh, tied into that identification piece, getting kind of uh, visibility across uh, your 
uh, patient's touch point to uh, or your member's touch point so that you uh, are able to flag kind of who are the highest risk and in immediate need or those that you can proactively manage. Um, Melissa, what, what are your thoughts on this? Sure. Um, so I guess, you know, before COVID hit, um, NPN definitely, you know, we're very aware that social determinants play a huge part um, in being barriers for patients to get care. Um, when we would um, reach out to patients who had really complex needs, um, we have this incredible community team made up of registered nurses um, and licensed mental health providers and case managers uh, who would go out. And a lot of times, you know, it would appear that their problems were medical or behavioral health. And yes, they were, but they were that way, definitely because there was some problem with accessing just the kind of basic needs, right? And so um, once COVID hit, you know, of course, we saw this all the more and um, a lot of the different services and resources that were available um, weren't currently available um, because people, of course, were very concerned about spreading it. Um, and so pretty quickly, um, we made a decision that we wanted to be a part of an online platform um, so that we could help our patients and also help the community. And, um, you know, we're kind of in the western Washington and we're also spreading out um, to the entire state in the next year. Um, so we wanted to be able to coordinate all of those services um, and resources for patients and have a closed loop referral. Um, and so we decided we we're going to um, invest in Unite Us um, along with a cu couple of other healthcare organizations um, in Washington state. Um, and again, not just to help our patients, um, but also to help the other providers, because I'm sure everybody who's worked, especially with like higher utilizer patients, understands that um, five different people can be doing exactly the same work, but unless they know about it, um, unless they know what one another doing, they're all just, you know, um, they're helping the patient with the same thing. They're duplicating that. Um, and so we've been really lucky um, with Collective Medical to really increase our communication um, across different medical providers and behavioral health providers and hospital providers. Um, but we also wanted to do that to a social service providers. Um, and so we um, have launched just in the um, last month or so um, here in Washington State. Um, and so we are, we're really excited um, to be able to, you know, just have higher visibility towards services, um, know if a patient um, received those services. If they didn't, someone else in the community who was also um, on the same platform would be able to go in and log in and see if they actually accessed it or remind them how to access it. Um, so that we can actually make sure that they get linked with that. Oh, I love it. Uh, I love what you said there, Melissa, because I think that merits kind of a specific call out. Certainly, uh, I within collective and and being a physician myself, we have primarily focused on kind of the medical and clinical side of that care coordination, whether it's behavioral health, COVID nineteen, et cetera, but. A huge component of managing the social determinant of health are those community-based organizations. And um, in the Northwest, it sounds like you all are working with Unite Us. I, I know uh, there's Aunt Bertha and Now Pal and a uh, set of, um, of community-based organization networks that are essentially linking the great work that they're doing around food, shelter, transport uh, uh, with uh, making it more available for hospital staff to access. So again, so they're not reinventing the wheel. And I think that space, um, um, having kind of managed high risk populations for my entire medical career, the, the opportunity to use technology as a platform to interact with those providers that frankly are often dealing with 
small budgets, a fair amount of turnover, and of course are very, very localized, so can't always benefit from the economy of scale as a health system, say, uh, could. Um, I just think is such such an exciting area of technology. I think we all uh, uh, wag our fingers in uh, in the healthcare space towards, in particular, uh, Silicon Valley and um, some of the 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 investment and venture focus on um, on uh, I think we're going to call them uh, first world problems. And I've been really excited about the recent focus in the last couple of years about uh, the social service cells and specifically technologies addressing on that last mile of healthcare and connectivity. You can tell I'm very excited about it, so I really appreciate you uh, you bringing it up. Uh, Carol Ann, I'll go back to you. You actually uh, kind of triggered this social determinants of health uh, deep dive with your mention of transportation, um, but I wanted to give, give you the opportunity to talk about uh, anything uh, else that you all are doing. Right, so one thing that I didn't mention before that as we were talking, I got to thinking about, and that is, Another way that we're utilizing the platform is that once we're doing those transition to care assessments and we're screening for the social determinants of health, when we're able to find, when we find something that, you know, truly would impact a patient's ability to, for instance, they have an ED visit and you're considering sending them home and um, it might be useful information though to the ED providers to know, what we do is we can go in the care insights and um, put some information. We can put who the care manager is that the patient's assigned to, the phone number of um, our care management team that can they can be reached through, and then any notes that we want to be able to communicate to that provider in the ED or into any other provider that has access and is seeing this patient. That way um, it prevents sometimes things from slipping through the cracks and a patient going home that um, doesn't have appropriate housing, for instance, or um, doesn't have a way to get meals. Maybe they need to feed them before they leave the ED, um, and maybe that's the reason they keep coming to the ED. We've seen that before, that the patient with the most frequent ED visits was just hungry, and they knew that the ED would feed them. And so um, being able to communicate that without having to make a lot of phone calls and um, having the old system back in, in my original ED days back in 30 years ago where we had the Rolodex that had all the patients in it that were frequent flyers and little notes about them. Now we have electronic means to communicate that in more real time. So um, that is the one other big thing that we're able to do with it. Oh, that's great. And of course, uh, for uh, those of you that are maybe newer either to the emergency department space or, or medicine in general, for general, what she's referring to is what used to be called the hot and the cot, which was a lot of active ED use was thought to be related to people related to uh, food and shelter and security, a uh, kind of warm, safe uh, bed and uh, hot, something to eat. Now, ironically, that was always used almost in the pejorative sense, like this is the way, a waste of our emergency department or these, these, these people, quote unquote, are taking up valuable provider time. I think, uh, fortunately, we've come around to understanding that that was very much emblematic of a problem in our healthcare system and really an opportunity that in fact by addressing this quote hot in the cot need, we actually can increase quality and decrease cost in healthcare. So uh, back to the social determinants of health, that hot in the cot need that she was referring to in fact uh, was a great way to get better visibility and identify um, uh, higher risk patients. Um, so we're going to do our kind of last set question and then dive into some of these great uh, audience questions. So just to get kind of a final thought, but and what I mean by final is just the final kind of official thought before we jump into the live Q&A, is I'd ask our three panelists to kind of think about what piece of advice would they share with uh, people thinking about doing value-based contracts in, uh, again, these very uncertain times. Uh, Melissa, let's start with you. Sure, thank you. Um, so I think I've got a couple of things. Um, the first thing is that if you are able um, to uh, take risk for both the medical portion of the contract and the behavioral health portion of the contract, um, I think that is immensely helpful. Um, if, 
you know, oftentimes what we'll see, um, and we currently have both, but oftentimes what we'll see is that we'll see that patients um, who really are going to the hospital um, because they have behavioral health challenges, um, they're going to a medical hospital um, to have those resolved. Um, or they have chronic issues, chronic medical issues, um, that their behavioral health challenges um, are exasperating. Um, so if we don't, when we don't have the behavioral health portion of the contract, if we're not at risk for that, um, then what happens is as soon as they go inpatient psychiatric, oftentimes we're not able to actively manage them um, to give them the level of care and follow up that we can give them on the medical side. Um, so we lose track of them and that um, amount of you know really important information. We still try our very best to work with inpatient behavioral health team, um, but it's more difficult. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, when you have risk for the behavioral health portion of the contract, um, you're also able to have higher reimbursement fees, um, and so then offer um, more uh, behavioral health providers and services um, that are really tailored to your patient's population to, to your network. Um, here in Washington, we have an incredible scarcity of mental health providers, um, and especially for Medicare and Medicaid patients, honestly, especially Medicare patients. Um, so when you're able to manage patients in your network across the in entire continuum, and as they say, the head isn't cut off from the rest of the body, um, you're just much more able to meet their needs and make sure that they're receiving the <clears throat> excuse me appropriate level of care um, that they need. Um, the other thing that I would say as a suggestion um, is that I think that there's some really great work that's being done when um, EMS is also when you can partner with EMS um, to do look at like taking a per member uh, per month. Um, so that they can assist in helping some of your population. So you take the community paramedicine programs um, and they're able to, like when the patient discharges from the hospital, um, go out to their health, do a medical um, or a medication reconciliation with them, really see kind of what's going on. Um, patients really love EMS, so they'll open their doors to them. Um, they can build relationships with them that are ongoing. Um, and a lot of times, a lot of the work that I've done over the past five years, um, I've seen that a lot of the different EMS districts often lack the funds to be able to create these positions because it's not, um, they're not getting paid um, a fee-for-service payment for the community paramedic to go out to the house like they are when they have a call. So they're not incentivized. And so just like all the rest of our systems, they need to be financially incentivized so that they can create these positions to reach out to these patients because they are great community partners um, when, when they're able to be. Um, and then I would also say for um, behavioral health too, um, we're looking at um, doing something similar with community behavioral health teams so that um, they can take um, risk for part of our population as well um, so that we can co-manage them together um, and make sure that they receive really effective, great care from them. Oh, wow, fantastic. I love, I love so many things you said there, even, from kind of your first point about our traditional and systemic separation of behavioral health from quote, physical health, whatever that means, and how that's manifested really in a, and I'm gonna use the term sausage making, but because so many active providers are kind of unaware sometimes of the business of healthcare. And I think that recognition, that natural separation that has existed or unnatural separation that exists, exists in the past between behavioral health, unquote, the, you know, the head from the rest of the body uh, is 
probably one of the underlying problems here and addressing that head on by kind of managing that risk altogether versus outsourcing potentially the management as so often is done today. And then I, I love your second piece about particular community paramedicine and uh, EMS and bringing them into the big um, um, umbrella of care coordination given their community relationships and frankly, they're lower cost compared to other sites of care. In other words, if you can uh, keep someone out of the hospital, particularly with a behavioral health um, diagnosis, which is often not the right place for them to be managed by using a community paramedicine program, EMS, some of these frontline providers that know these patients well, already have deep relationships. Again, really important for quality uh, and also cost reduction. Um, awesome, thank you. Um, uh, Deborah Jean, I'd love your thoughts on this as well. Great. Well, first off, I agree with everything both you and Melissa have said. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to start there. But I and and to highlight the one advice when you say one piece of advice, you have to have uh, representation from all of the sectors that affect your patient population including behavioral health, and, and I would say the social determinant side as well. Ha however you can do that, financially, they need to be part of the overall um, incentive program because incentives work, right? If that's the first rule of economics is that the people respond to incentives. And it is about what are we paying for in the system, ultimately in order to get the value that we want out of that system. So paying for something like an EMS to do a home visit is far cheaper than any ED visit you're going to get and, and actually far more effective, right? So is there a way that in your ACO, in your plan, you have representation of everybody and incentivization for everybody about how we're going to collectively um, work with the patient population. And it does mean you have to stratify your patient population. So what do you need for your most at risk, right? Those care teams that we've all been explaining with the nurses and the community health workers, who, who are your moderate risk and what, what, uh, what do you need for them? And, and then what are your lower risk and what do you need to provide for them in order to coordinate care and make sure they get their care? So you need to have all the right people and players as part of that system. Oh, love it. Again, a, a more emphasis on that uh, financial incentive alignment. And I, all the data shows that behavioral health drives all other care. Uh, thinking back to the kind of University of Washington study, which was kind of the earliest example of this, that you cannot manage a depressed diabetic uh, blood sugar without first managing their depression. And so ensuring that you have the right care providers and the right uh, incentives at the table to support them. Uh, ter terrific, terrific advice. Uh, so Carol Ann, we're going to you last uh, what, on your uh, advice. Sure, and I agree with what both of what all three of you have said so far, um, and definitely those were on my list. But um, speaking of the um, the financials part, is something that I wanted to throw in. And we were talking about getting engagement with the with EMS and with behavioral health and all that. But we can't forget the providers. And so when I was asking this question to some of my colleagues here uh, in prep for today, the um, one of the things that I heard from them is that make sure that the financials have to be provider friendly in order to get the provider buy-in and to change behavior. Um, in some of our contracts, we've not been able to do that. That team of care managers is basically carrying the load, um, in some, in, particularly in the Danville market, um, because they're the ones closing care gaps and doing all that on behalf of the providers. And it's because they are you know, those contracts were negotiated a long time ago before we realized all this. And so it's really important as you're going forward and looking at new value-based contracts to make sure that the financials are going to be incentivizing to the providers so that you can get their buy-in too. Awesome. That's, I, I think, also great advice and, and kind of a good, a good kind of final 
for a paired question, now it looks like we have a couple coming in, and actually one of them centers on something we really haven't covered at all, um, which is generally uh, terrifying for kind of all uh, all providers that uh, don't aren't actively trained to manage them, which is talking about the pediatric population and taking a little bit we are the world uh, theme and uh, children being our future and not just infection vectors for COVID-19 and distractions from us trying to do uh, webinars uh, or Zoom calls. I'd love uh, for uh, you all to give some thoughts specific to the pediatric population. Um, so we talked about social determinants of health, for example, and um, adverse childhood events and, and things that can be unique to that population. Um, pretty much anybody can go first. Um, uh, why not, uh, Melissa, why don't you start? Sure. Um, so we um, are working with some of our accountable communities of health um, here in Washington, and um, there are different strategies that you know, we've contracted to adopt. And one of them is definitely um, targeting our pediatrics population um, and looking at ACEs um, and also looking at behavioral health integration. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, we went through this um, one-year pilot with the University of Washington Ames Center through a different com Accountable Communities of Health um, where we really learned all about the collaborative care model, um, which is just an incredible model um, of behavioral health integration. Um, it's wonderful for the patients, um, especially patients who um, would be less likely to reach out to behavioral health just because of the stigma. Um, you get to do warm handoffs between primary care and behavioral health. You have a psychiatric consultant there as well. Um, so we um, spent a year um, learning how to do that model and got really great support from them, um, making sure that we were doing it correctly. Um, it's evidence-based, it's treat to target. Um, so we are um, making sure that all of our peds population um, is screened for depression um, and also for social determinants of health as well. And then we're beginning a pilot. We're being I'm doing a few different pilots, but um, one of our partners, um, the Everett Clinic, um, which is up north from where we're at um, in Pierce County, um, the Everett Clinic is um, doing uh, three different pilots, one of them the pediatric pilot, um, so that uh, patients who are in need, patients and their families who are in more um, need of a more robust um, level of care um, can be part of this. And so the behavioral health provider um, can support the primary care provider, um, but also, of course, you know, support the patient and their family um, and connecting them with not only behavioral health needs, um, but also, of course, again, social determinant of health needs. So we're really excited about that. And I can't um, speak highly enough about the collaborative care model. Um, I just, I've been a huge part of it, and I've loved implementing it and love the success, especially for difficult to reach patients. Awesome. Thank you. And I think we just have a couple of minutes. Uh, let's switch coasts. Let's go from the Northwest back to Mass. Deborah Jean, love your thoughts on that pediatric question. Thank you, Ben. And I want to thank the person who put this question in because. Um, Unfortunately, children do tend to be the afterthought in the healthcare system and in behavioral health as well. So thank you for the question. Like Melissa, uh, Massachusetts has actually been working with the child population to provide care coordination, collaborative care since 2005 when we won a class action lawsuit um, against the state Medicaid program for not providing uh, preventative um, diagnostic treatment and testing services for children in the Medicaid program. So we established the Children's Behavioral Health Initiative back in 2006. And when the state went to the ACO model um, about four years ago now, they rolled the children's services in. So like the community partners that are working with adults, the CBHI providers are working with children. And on top of uh, making them more robust 
um, and providing more for them, more incentive for them, and including them in the system. We also have um, a community providers that uh, do specific work around long-term services and supports, and that population for pediatrics um, are our, our autistic children or our multi-handicapped children, really, really complex children. So we have a program within the whole ACO model specific for the most complicated children, so they're getting support in the system along with the other Medicaid child population. So um, really critical to be looking at our children. They are our future, as you said, Ben, and um, this is where we can have a really big impact um, in years going forward if we can help change the trajectory for these children and their families early on. Oh, Deborah Jean, what a great, what a great and positive uh, way to end. Speaking of that particular opportunity, again, we've gotten a lot more questions, but we are officially out of time. I appreciate all the presenters coming in and bringing us their insights from all across the country, and of course, all of you that participated. Your terrific questions. If we did not get to them in this hour, we will follow up with you and connect you to some of the presenters who have better insights than I can provide. I've just learned a lot on this. So again, thank you to the presenters. Thank for all of you taking your time out of your day to join us. Please send us more questions, et cetera. Um, uh, thanks to Beckers for putting this together, and I hope everybody has a lovely, lovely day. Any uh, last comments, Mackenzie? No, I just want to say thank you all um, so much for such a great presentation and discussion today, and thank you to Collective Medical for sponsoring today's roundtable discussion. Um, like Ben said, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day, and we look forward to having you join us for future presentations. Thanks, everyone.